Meanwhile, Palestinian families flee their homes in northern Gaza Strip as the Israeli military is preparing to unleash a large-scale bombardment of the besieged territory. And we didn't want to leave the house, but they threw bombs on us, firing with their tanks from the sea, from the air. So there was nowhere to hide in the house. It was like our home was going to go red with all the flames. We have fled out of fear for our children because of all the Israeli shelling and bombing. Our children are traumatized. The displaced families have sought refuge at a United Nations school in Gaza City. The Israeli army claims that the attack will target the rocket launchers of Palestinian fighters. So far, Israeli warplanes have bombed some 1,300 targets in the Gaza Strip, killing scores of people. According to a UN report, nearly 80 percent of the victims have been civilians. Well, to get the latest on that situation, we're now joined by Akram al Satari, Press TV's correspondent, who is joining us live now from the Gaza Strip. Now, Akram, tell us, um, at this time, where exactly are people running to? Uh, we know about, of course, is the UN school in Gaza City, but I would imagine that that has limited space. Where else are people going to who are fleeing? Well, in the last press conference that was held by the director of uh, UNRWA operations in the Gaza Strip, he said that the capacity of the UNRWA schools throughout the Gaza Strip is 35,000 Palestinians, while the estimate number of people who would be fleeing to those schools is 50,000 uh, Palestinians, including the families in the Gaza North. This means the capacity of the UNRWA is not uh, is not that capacity to absorb all the number of Palestinians. Besides that, the Palestinians still recall the very hard memories about the people who were killed in the Gaza North inside one of the UNRWA schools. The Israeli army is asking them to, free their, to flee their houses and leave, leave and move to the Gaza City. But the key questions the Palestinians are asking now, is Gaza City safe? Is any other place safe in the Gaza Strip? The news about the targeting, we have just heard the news about targeting a new house in the Gaza Middle Zone in a Nusayrat area, in a Nusayrat refugee camp. And this is one of the indications that there is no safe haven in the Gaza Strip. People were killed in the street when they are trying to flee from the ongoing fire against Against them, people were killed in the mosque when they're per, when they're performing their rituals. People were killed in the schools. People were killed in the other facilities that they thought it would be a safe shelter for them. The situation is dire. Israel is using that as a pretext to cause a large-scale displacement among Palestinians and to bring them as much as uh, as much more uh, discourages and destruction as they could. The situation is dire. Palestinians have nowhere to go. No safe haven in Gaza, and Israel is continuing its attacks against the Palestinians in violation of the international humanitarian charters and of the in all international conventions that are entitling human beings everywhere to a full protection, their shelter, their houses, and their children. This is not happening in Gaza. The law is being violated, and Israel thinks that by informing the families, they are uh, justifying their vicious actions against the people of Gaza. And, you know, uh, Akram, of course, Israel is justifying this, 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 this mass displacement by saying that, you know, uh, that the rocket launchers are in the north of Gaza Strip. Um, is there any truth to that? And secondly, tell us about the, the, the willpower of the Palestinian people um, and especially the Gazans. How much support uh, are they giving, for example, to this resistance movement and to these rocket launchers, etc.? Well, for the past six days, Israeli troops have been targeting 1,100 different locations, claiming that those locations are Palestinian resistant locations or rocket launchers. For your information, the, inform the fire that is coming from Gaza, the rockets that are being that are hitting Palestine occupied 48, never stopped even for one moment. This means that the Israeli army is failing to use the air troops to stop the fire rockets from the fire from falling into the Israeli cities. What they are doing now is they are using this, as I said before to make the, pay, the Palestinians understand they are paying the price of the ongoing resistance and they are paying the price of their own existence and survival. The Palestinian community from its side have been watching yesterday, for example, how the Palestinian resistance were firing the rockets against Tel Aviv and how the rockets were falling and they were rejoicing everything. They know they have to live under this constant threat of death. They know they are targeted. 
They know there are no safe haven, and they know also because I talked to many people in the past few days. They know that they have no other option but to fire back and to keep steadfastness in the Gaza Strip. And they know they are being targeted either way. They know that Israel is willing and carrying death to them, and they know that there is no only resort. There is no resort but the resistance and the fire back. So they are supporting the resistance. They are rejoicing the achievement of the rockets that are being launched towards Palestine occupied 48. And they are no, uh, fully aware they might get killed any time in their, in their homes or elsewhere by the Israeli and discriminatory fire. Okay, Akram, I'm being told that you have a guest with you, in fact, that you wanted to interview as well. Um, so you can go ahead and interview that guest. Well, we talked about the uh, different atrocities and the great risk that Palestinians are exposed to. We talked about the unleashed power that is use, uh, used against the Palestinians. And I met Dr. Eric Fosse. Dr. Eric was there in Gaza in the back in 2008, 2012, and he was in Gaza last May, and he's now with us. We had a little bit of a conversation about the severity of the injuries and the possible cause of the severity of those injuries, and I think he has some findings to share with us and with the viewers about what's happening in Gaza. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank we you. had a little bit of a conversation about the weapons that might be used mm. in the Gaza Strip and whether they are internationally banned or not. Tell us about your initial findings, please. Yes, uh, we actually see t three types of injuries. The, major yeah. the, the majority are uh, uh, patients that have been inside houses that have been bombed. And this is actually also something we didn't see so much during the 2009 war, that they obviously target people's own during night. Uh -huh. Last night we had large families coming in. We had more than 30 patients coming in at one time from houses that had been uh, bombed and these patients of course they are hit by the explosive or by uh, pieces of the building then of course we also see people from injured from uh, uh, anti-personal uh, weapons that are weapons that are directed towards killing people we see conventional anti-personal weapons uh, they are typically hit by a number of shrapnels and have multiple wounds and we also see, like we did in 2009, uh, victims of these uh, so-called dime bombs, the dense inert metal explosives. These are small, uh, lightweight bombs dropped from uh, the drones. They are highly accurate. And they explode on the ground, and the patient is hit by uh, kind of a metal vapor that, in a way, tear away their lower body. Very few of these patients survive, and if they survive, uh, only half the man is left, actually. Well, you have been watching that in the surgery rooms and also in the ICU uh, department. Yes. So how many children and women and elderly people you saw there? And what is your impression about the nature of the injuries in there? Yeah. Are they militants? Do you think they are militants? How many oh. old, older and, and young men you saw there? No, there is about 30% of the injured. Like during the war in 2009, they are children. And uh, most of the people that come here, they are civilians. They uh, are old people or, uh, of course, some of them are middle-aged men, but they are killed in their homes, not in a battle. And we don't know what uh, their profession is. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, all the patients I see here are civilians so far. From your own humanitarian perspective, how did you feel seeing those injuries and their severity? No, this is, you know, there are several levels of tragedy here put on top of each other. One thing is, of course, an injured person that loses the limbs. I mean, to survive here in people in Gaza have very little future anyway. And uh, to lose your legs, you have no, no future. You cannot sustain a family. So uh, that's a tragedy in itself. Then, of course, you have the problem of families being torn uh, uh, apart. We have uh, one child lying here. She lost all her family, all, both her parents and all her brothers and sisters. We have uh, one man that lost all his family while he was out shopping. Uh, so uh, the families are torn apart and they suffer great losses. So we also have a lot of grieving people coming here. And it's really heartbreaking to, uh, to watch. And then it's also the general condition of the people in Gaza at the moment, because they have been under siege now since 2007. 
this was uh, getting much more grave after the uh, the coup in uh, Egypt where they closed uh, the tunnels which actually kept people alive so now uh, they they uh, have no fuel for the for cooking for heating for light uh, they are depleted of food they are depleted of drugs the prices go up and most of them are now unemployed because as the country is blocked most companies are bankrupt so the general condition before they even are attacked is uh, is very uh, serious and i think uh, you mentioned that the people were cheering uh, during the rockets against Tel Aviv, um, even if they know that they are going to be... Yes. Uh, and that is quite true. People were sitting around the television here uh, cheering, and I think that's because they have no longer anything to lose. They will be killed slowly by starvation. Or quickly by the airstrikes. Or quickly by the strikes. So that's, what the, that's their choice. And have, they have choose the latter. Having met the uh, professionals, the physicians in the Ashifa yeah. Hospital, which is the largest uh, medical center in the Gaza Strip, mm. and having been in the surgery rooms in the different worlds, yeah. how do you think the health system is coping, and do you think it can go on for a very long time on light of this very great lack and loss? First of all, I would say, unfortunately, the surgeons in Al Shifa are probably the most experienced trauma surgeons in the world. They have faced these situations now repeatedly. I mean, it's not only the large wars. They, are, they are, have these type of injuries daily, weekly, every year. So they are very experienced and they really treat... Uh, I'm very impressed by working with them. But uh, we, are, uh, we have problem of getting in spare parts for uh, advanced technology. Uh, we are uh, losing the stocks of, uh, the, the, of uh, disposables and essential drugs. So uh, it's hard to say, you know, what they're going to do here probably is to prioritize Chifa and they will close down other hospitals. So first it's the patients with the chronic diseases that will suffer because they have no resources to treat them. But after a while, even we will not be able to manage uh, the patients coming in. So this has to stop. And how person. about people with acute injuries, like people coming with amputations, people coming with serious injuries in need for life, for life support, and in need also for medications and disposables? So Do far, you think so yeah. far the, system, the health system can cope, and for how yeah. long? We cope now, but you know, we haven't had the real mass casualty situations uh, yet. We had our first minor mass casualty situation last night, but uh, uh, I'm expecting uh, that this will develop more or less like in 2009, and then we will see uh, uh, events where we have maybe 70 patients coming at once, okay. and I really fear for, uh, for that. We I'm not sure we can cope. We all fear for that. So this is the image from uh, the Gaza city, the increased number of casualties, a health system that is struggling to provide the uh, very needed medical assistance to the people and also a courageous uh, cruise, uh, medical crews that are struggling to survive and to help other people survive. Back to studio now. Okay, Akram, thanks very much for that. And of course, we do appreciate the, the dear doctor's comments as well.